It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speakers, Dean Penship and Regina Wetzer. Dean is a biodiversity research scientist, and Regina is an associate curator and director of the Marine Biodiversity Center at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Dean spent most of his UC Berkeley graduate school years in Puget Sound, and Regina completed her PhD at the University of South Carolina on molecular and morphological systematics of crustaceans. Isopods are pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, they work with an extraordinary team of invertebrate collection managers who oversee and curate over 35 phyla in the Natural History Museum's marine invertebrate collections. In 2016, they launched the, the Diversity Initiative for the Southern California Ocean, in which they call DISCO. This research initiative is greatly enhanced, enhancing biodiversity documentation of the marine environment by applying modern genetic technology. The title of Clyde's talk is Biodiversity in Our Ocean, a Natural History Museum's Vision. Please help me welcome Dean Penchuk and Regina Wetzel. Thank you very much, and thank you for all coming out on a Friday night. So, first off, let's launch into biodiversity. What is it? Everybody's pretty much aware of what it looks like. It uh, comes in all shapes and sizes. It's on the scales of ecosystems, communities, species. It's biodiversity of genes and the diversity of the genetic matter. So, we have a, a full view of what that might look like. So I'm one of these people that likes to step back and know what I'm walking into to see the whole picture. Um, so we're going to do that really briefly with a, a whirlwind tour of the diversity of um, our planet of all kinds of organisms and organisms that we don't necessarily think of on a, a specific day. So this is all biodiversity. This particular phylogenetic tree that is up on the screen, I'm, I'm used to running over here so you'll I'll try to break that tendency, um, is based on uh, genetic data that is publicly available from everything from bacteria to archaea to animals, and it looks terribly overwhelming. There's the area that's grayed in, things that are more common and that we are more familiar with, and that is going to be the, the point of our talk this evening. Um, and they include um, organisms that we're familiar with. You see worms up there just above it, vertebrates and echinoderms, the deuterostomes, and we hone in on this and we're about there. We're this little tiny blurb. So let's pop right back out. And there we are in the whole big picture. So we can argue back and forth. So again, if we look at this tree for one second longer, arthropod seems to be a lot. And as I already said, this is based on molecular data. There are lots of folks who have been spending a lot of time sequencing a whole bunch of insects. Insects the most diverse group of all uh, animals. Um, and you can see the biases along the, the, uh, the tree. So this is heavily biased toward genetic data and where people have put emphasis. On the flip side, the diversity within animals these are the phyla. There's 34 of them up there. We can argue if something is a phylum or not. And based on genetic data, we've been reorganizing things. That seems to be something that people in museums do. It comes unwelcome. Some of these taxa you will be very familiar with. Everybody knows what an arthropod is. Includes the crustaceans. Annelids include the polychaete worms in the marine world. Nematodes small and so forth. Some of these taxa are uh, so rare that even those of us that get to work in museums and see all of them don't have an opportunity to actually um, get wet, squishy specimens of them very often. So one should ask, well, where does all of this diversity come from? It all has a single origin, a single origin of life. And we can think of an, uh, the origination of life being a particular point. We'll put time on the y-axis, and I'm going to show you this animation, and then we'll, we'll talk through it. So slowly, as you see the little red dot in the bottom right, it's bifurcating, species are radiating, radiations are happening, things are becoming more and more diverse. And as this tree is filling in and time is marching on, you're also looking at all of these little branches that go nowhere. Time is going all the way up to present, 
And all of these things here along the way are organisms that have gone extinct. 90% of everything that has ever lived on Earth has gone extinct. 90% of everything that's lived on Earth has gone extinct. Wow. So, to now, the little green line is what we observe today. So that's the point of view that we come to it. If we're looking at fossil organisms, if we're looking or talking about dinosaurs, which we do a lot in um, museums, we talk about some of these extinct branches. But otherwise, we have only this top-down view. This top-down view, each species, you can think of as a book. It contains all of the knowledge over time from this very origin, is captured in those lineages that have made it to the present and that are with us today. On a more local note, those of you that have children, grandchildren, are a success story from here all the way to the present. Those of us that do not are a lineage that stops and can't be reproduced, at least not at the moment. So we have all of these volumes and volumes of books, all of these organisms that we're wanting to study. Of all of the organisms, all of the animals that we have, and again, I'm, I'm biasing toward animals this evening, we have about a million described species, things that are described based on morphological characteristics and that are named by Linnaean uh, Latin naming system. We estimate there's about 5 million to 10 million things that don't even have names. We don't have to go very far to name something new. We can do it right here out on the beach at Point Furman. So lots of things don't have names. <coughs> Pretty impressive. So how do we just study this biodiversity? Well, at the Natural History Museum, this is a photo of uh, the facade of, of our building. It's built in 1913, will be 107 years old this year. We're about the third or fourth largest institution, Natural History Museum institution in the United States. We compete with the Smithsonian, not compete, but in, in terms of size, we are comparable to Smithsonian Holdings, American Museum, and Field Museum. Um, collections are always biased in these institutions, and so we have strengths in, in some areas that are greater than others. Museums are places where you keep things forever. That is my job as a curator, is making sure that whatever is in these buildings, collections that have been made, um, are kept forever. Uh, only a small portion of the material, the research objects, are actually on display, as they are here at, at this institution as well. And a lot of stuff is in basements and in off-site um, facilities. We also do public engagement, lots and lots of it. We have exhibits that are outward facing. We do museum public programs. And oh, yes, I have to mention the dinosaurs. My dinosaur colleagues remind me of that all the time, but tonight we get to talk about invertebrates, which I'm going to spend most of my time on. <laughs> and then back to the basement. This is where a good portion of my staff spend our time um, in the alcoholic collections. Most invertebrates are wet preserved, are in glass jars, so curation once they're in beautiful jars, filled up with 80% or 95% ethanol can last indefinitely with minimal care. So how do we add to this biodiversity library um, today? How do we do that? So we maintain these existing collections, but we continue to make new collections as well. We do the classical thing, things that haven't changed in a long time. We do visual surveys of the diver over here in the Kelp Forest is doing a visual survey, visual transect surveys probably happening here. How many of you in this room have participated on beach sands right out here at Cabrillo, where this photo is from? I can see some of the staff hands going up. We can use um, uh, dredges, trawls, nets of any sort. So anybody can collect. You don't want to use a noodle sieve to try to collect a big fish, but you know you can catch the straining of, of the pasta going by. So a net of some sort catches most things. We work with a whole bunch of partners. Uh, again, taking organisms is, is fraught. Um, we need to be thoughtful and, and, and um, useful at it. We collaborate with a whole bunch of folks, um, some listed here. And one that I want to point out specifically, because it does live here locally, 
is the uh, Ocean Exploration Trust and the Nautilus, which right now is not in port. Uh, I think she's still down in Ensenada and Dry Dock. But if some of you have seen her or you have live in the neighborhood and when she comes back, um, I do encourage you to take advantage of open houses. This is a, a wonderfully outfitted um, piece of equipment that has wonderful unmanned ROVs that are really quite capable. There's folks on board the boat that drive it. There's operators that run the ROVs and lab techs and the like. But what's kind of outstanding about it is there's only one or two scientists on board. And you go, really? You're sending out research vessels without scientists? Well, that's because all of the uh, work that they do is being live streamed, real time, and you can watch it from home. And that's how scientists chime in all over the world and help them uh, identify organisms at the bottom of the sea. Again, they do a lot of visual surveys. They also do lots of sea floor mapping, and that's a very big piece of their work. And then I can sometimes call in, or some of my, my colleagues in my lab can call in and say, we don't have material from this species. Can you please pick it up? And that happens. There's laboratory space on board where this material gets uh, processed. Water samples, soil samples, or sediment samples, and all the light comes on board. And this is a shout out for women. There's a lot of women on board these boats, so young ladies in the room, please step up. And I also understand, not having been on the vessel myself out to sea, that the ROV operators are female. And again, everyone can participate. The URL up above, nautiluslive.org. Everything's live streamed. You can watch it. You can ask questions in real time. I'll tell you how science works. Sometimes the ocean floor is very, very boring. And sometimes really cool things go by at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so coming back to our um, museum collections, I said they were large and they were housed in warehouses and off-site facilities and in the basement. So the marine invertebrate collection at our museums, the bar on the left is the number of specimen lots that are estimated in these collections. And the mollusks include the snails, the gastropods, the bivalves, polypeat worms, the annelid worms, crustacean collections, the echinoderm, the other phyla. We have a very large invertebrate paleontology collection. These data were collected roughly in about 1910 is when we made this table. And to be very honest, I have no idea how accurate it is. I have a team of three or four people, including a bunch of undergraduates right now, trying to assess how many lots there are. There's lots of them. And that's not even the number of specimens in lots, because a specimen can be a, a specimens can be one individual in a lot, or it can be a jar of krill that can have a thousand specimens in it. So I have no idea how many are in our collections to say much about how um, they're not necessarily all cataloged yet either. So challenges ahead. Uh, fossil collections are large, and I'm pointing them out here again because I showed you the phylogenetic tree of all the taxa that have gone extinct and the species that have gone extinct. Well, in some cases, you have um, species that can be alive today but have fossils up in the upper um, banks of the shore. They wash out here, right in front of Cabrillo Beach. Some things are extinct, some things are continuously alive today. And one of the strengths of our museum collections is this continuum of recent material and also going back into um, the more distant path. So I've told you a little bit about our museums and how what goes on in museums and our interests. But that's also 19th century, I guess, right? So what are we doing about the 21st century? You want to hear about something new tonight. Well, the DISCO initiative, diversity initiative, the Southern California Ocean, and yes, we agonized over this acronym. Please come do visit us. We do have a DISCO ball in our lab. <laughs> We're going into our third, fourth year of this project. And one aspect of this project is not only to add to existing collections, um, utilizing existing collections and adding to them, but one of the techniques that we are um, using is genetic DNA barcoding, nothing spectacular or new specifically. Um, there's a great diversity of organisms, which I already mentioned, lots of animal <coughs> phyla, and that's what I'm interested in. And all of the taxa, all of these phyla, all of these specimens have unique DNA. That's why we can distinguish them as species. 
except the copepods, the non-parasitic copepods. They were the bane of my dissertation, almost didn't finish. They still don't have DNA. I'll tell you about them some other time. <laughs> um, but if you can pick a particular region of DNA, so there's their DNA, all different uh, kinds of it, that you can isolate a piece of their DNA that is, um, varies just enough between species such that you can identify the DNA um, of the organism just based on that little fragment. You don't need the whole genome, you just need like, a short fragment. Usually about 600, 500 to 800 base pairs will do. So not too novel, but you know, you got unique DNA sequences. If you have the DNA sequence, then you would be able to identify the specimen, right? So this is how it works. You're a very good taxonomist. You know the name of this organism. So you give it a, a genus species identification. You take a little piece of its DNA. You amplify, you make many copies of this little short region that you've identified. You put it through a fancy little sequencing machine. You do a whole bunch of little uh, hocus pocus in terms of chemistry. It comes in a box. Everybody can do it, including high school students. We do it all the time. And then you file in an international database and make publicly available those fragments of DNA attached to that specimen's name. <coughs> totally cool. OK, everybody can do it. Database is publicly accessible, open to everyone. So now, say you don't know what the name of this thing is, or somebody has no idea how to figure that out. But you can do all the other, other steps. You can go ahead and extract the DNA, amplify it, sequence it, put it into the DNA barcode database, or match it against the DNA barcode database, and it will find the one that was previously identified, and it will tell you the name. How cool is that, right? No dissection necessary. Don't need to get your hands wet. Well, barcode genes, these like, just like a cereal box in the grocery store, or the milk carton, or anything else that you run over a scanner, that little region for animals most commonly is used the mitochondrial um, cytochrome oxidase gene. Other genes, 16S and 18S, sometimes get used as well. Different ones are used for plants. Fungi, you would use different ones. Bacteria use a 16S. So there's a, f a few variations of that. OK, moving right along. Environmental DNA. So we said everything has DNA. So our little octopus has DNA. He also has all kinds of microbiomes attached to him, his last meal, all of his ocean friends. They all have DNA. Um, they all shed DNA. It comes off as skin, they, they have eggs, they have sperm, they poop, they die, they decay. Um, it can be coming in all sorts and fashions. So what happens next is you now have um, a big database that has lots of carefully edited and filed sequences that we've developed for all these critters. So now you can go out, take a water sample or a soil sample. Some people do it with an air sample, but we'll focus on water for right now. And you filter all of the DNA on a very little filter, a very small net, out. You do a process of DNA extraction, amplification, and all of that. Put it through a um, high throughput sequencing machine. Make shorter fragments, not quite as long as those barcode reads, but long enough. You get thousands and thousands and thousands of reads because there's lots of buddies in the water with that octopus. He's got all the friends. Everybody that was out there with him and that's left DNA behind is being picked up. Okay, so just think of forensics in, in that kind of uh, scenario. So then next, you want to match up with a whole bunch of really good computational biologists. And a tip for anybody looking for future jobs, area of, of uh, great expertise needed, folks that can do computational bio um, uh, analyses, bioinformatics types people that can interact with biologists. This has been coming challenging to interpret these data. So definitely great opportunities there. And those folks, again with biologists, can churn out 
community inventories, giant species list of everybody that was in that sample of water or sample of soil or the like. How cool is that? So, pretty simple. You go out on a boat, you get a Niskin bottle, make sure it's really clean, highly sensitive techniques. So small amounts of DNA are now being amplified, so kind of like forensics, you've got to be a little bit more careful. You wash it very carefully, collect the liter of seawater, you run it through a filter, a really tiny screen, um, gravity filter it, you have your DNA on a little filter, you move on to the next step of amplifying it and running it through the fancy sequencing machine and then generate all of the um, um, taxa, taxon lists. So, eDNA has great potential. It's much quirkier than uh, uh, other surveys. It has much, much larger, deeper, comprehensive uh, taxonomic coverage. It can be anything from bacteria to fungi to animals to plants to algae, anything that you're specifically putting primers in there to look for it. And it's a much, much cheaper inventory. So we're not done not yet. Not done yet. <laughs> So we're doing this as, as a cooperative venture, as we, as we do at work. Um, I'm going to do the check-in here. Can people hear me? Yeah. Am I okay? Okay, great. I will tip this up a little bit and continue on, because where I would like to take up is where Regina left off. Um, I'd like to start talking about some specifics. So I'm going to start talking about a particular study that we've been involved in. And this is a study at, up at Pillar Point, which is a spot um, up near San Francisco. And this was a study that uh, was designed in collaboration uh, between us and some people we work with, um, the California Academy of Sciences up in San Francisco, um, which has been working in the Pillar Point area for a number of years, and also collaborators that we work with at UCLA in the, a project called CalEDNA that's working to look at um, environmental DNA uh, research across the entire state of California, both in, in uh, terrestrial systems and aquatic systems. The idea of this study started here. Um, at Pillar Point, for a number of years, the California Academy of Sciences has been running a community science project that takes advantage of this platform called iNaturalist that many of you may be familiar with that allows anybody to go out into the natural world, make observations of organisms, and post those observations to a central platform, the iNaturalist platform, with a photograph, the exact time and the exact location that this thing was observed. That accumulates over time into a very large database of occurrences of organisms, whether they, again, whether they're marine or birds or worms or plants, this is all accumulating in this database. The Cal Academy uh, folks have been taking groups out to this pillar point area for a number of years and have accumulated a very large number of observations. You'll notice on that sheet there, there's 21,000 observations at this area. And to give you an idea of how concentrated that is, let me show you a map. The red dot in the middle, is, you can see, is, is near San Francisco. I'll zoom in as we zoom in on that point. You can see it coming in. And the red dots here are the observations um, that have accumulated. So this is one of the probably most intensively observed intertidal spots in the world. One of the things that's pretty cool about the iNaturalist platform is that the observations in that platform that get registered there undergo a series of review processes. And those that are reviewed and deemed by multiple observers to be a correct identification are then propagated through to an international database called GBIF. And GBIF stands for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and is used by not only these um, observational records, but also archives, um, physical records of specimens in museums. So it all comes together in this one extraordinary repository. Um, the, that's, this is an overview map of everything that GBIF, um, all the specimens that they have registered, and they can sequester out, and they can um, isolate the iNaturalist observations within that set. And if we zoom in on a map from GBIF, that looks very, very similar. These are the same observations that have now propagated out to GBIF. So what we wanted to do in this study was compare these human observations made over a number of years by hundreds of people with an environmental DNA approach to the same spot. 
So if we went and uh, surveyed, actually we took sediment samples there, took sediment samples and looked at the environmental DNA in those sediment samples, went through that process that Regina told you about of getting all the sequences, all the unique sequences out of those, and then getting those inventory lists, how would the two compare? Before I tell you about that, I also just want to jump for a moment and tell you that we're actually starting to do the same thing here in Point Furman. We're trying to accumulate those same kinds of iNaturalist observations here. We do have a series of multiple years of eDNA samples from the Point Furman area that we will be comparing. But the work I'm going to tell you about now is from Pillar Point because we're further ahead on that project. So going back to Pillar Point, here's the results. Let me walk you through this. Here's a quick look at what we found. So the yellowish bars, um, starting at the top, is the number of species that have been observed by people at that Pillar Point site. And it's 726 different species have been observed. The orange bar shows the number of unique taxa that we were able to pull out with the environmental DNA, which is 4,631 taxa. It's a lot more than we're able to, uh, we were able to isolate from vi visual observations. We can also look at this at higher taxonomic levels, so grouping things that are similar and calling them one thing. So looking at it at the level of genus rather than species. We take the same comparison. Again, um, 563 genera uh, noted on the observations, 2,684 um, from the eDNA, and similar patterns as you go up through families, orders, classes, and eventually in phyla, the, the largest groupings of animals um, that we observe. So many, many more species um, observed with the eDNA than with the visual observations. In a way, this is not surprising. We can take a look at what larger groupings of species were seen, and no surprise. If you look, the, the GBIF label is the, the iNaturalist visual observations. You can see that big red section is animals. So people see a lot of animals. People record a lot of plants as well. And the other segment, that orangish um, segment, uh, chromista, that's algae. That's a brown algae. So those are the big things that people are able to see and record. If you look at the eDNA portion, though, you see the rest of the picture. Yeah, you see animals. Yep, you see plants. But you also see a huge number of bacteria, huge number of archaea, or a small number, but a reasonable number of archaea, another bacterial type of group, um, and other organisms that we are just not likely to see. So that's one of the aspects of eDNA that's really interesting is we get to see a lot more of the world with that tool than we can with our hands and with our eyes. One of the key questions with this kind of eDNA sampling that we always have to ask is, are we sampling enough? Here's some data that tells you um, our, how our sampling was doing in this particular study. What you're seeing here is for a whole bunch of different taxon groups, um, a curve that shows as you move towards the right on the x-axis and the curves go up and over, how many taxa are we detecting as we sample more and more, or sequence more and more and more and more of the samples? And the fact that those curves are leveling out tells us that, yeah, we're pretty much squeezing this dry. If we kept on doing more and more and more and more sequencing, we're not really gonna find too much more there. So the eDNA sampling that we're doing looks like it was actually pretty well calibrated to pick up what's actually the variability that we could possibly pick up with this technology. So this is the interesting part, though. Let me explain this graph briefly. This is graphing the overlap in identification between the visual observations from iNaturalist, or GBIF, and the eDNA. The eDNA observations, that same 4,631 that I mentioned before, is that yellowish circle. The bluish circle is the GBIF, or iNaturalist observations, 726. 35 taxa appeared by name in both, which is kind of sucky. Um, when you think about it, wouldn't you expect that whole blue visual observation thing to be nested within the molecular observations? I mean, you know, if the thing's big enough that we can point at it and pick it up and take a picture of it, surely it should have left some DNA behind that we found. There's several reasons we think why we have such little overlap in identified taxa there. Here's the key one. The barcode database that Regina mentioned earlier, where we've been trained taxonomists doing tissue samples, named sp species, those references going into a database, that database for marine invertebrates is horrible. Um, 
right around here, for example, we think based on some lists around here, there's sort of three to 5,000 species of marine macro invertebrates. So fair size invertebrates, things you could pick up. Um, the last time we checked the, the database, there were about 500 spe of those species in that database. So 500 out of three, three to 5,000. So what we think is happening is that we are probably picking up the DNA of many of the same species that people are visually identifying and recording, but we don't have a reference sequence for those species in the database yet. So sure, it's a unique taxon, but we can't give it a name that could match the name that the iNaturalist observers have given it. So that comes up as not matching, even though we're probably picking up the DNA itself. So given that, one of the key missions of this DISCO project that we're doing, the Diversity Initiative, is to fill in that database for Southern California as much as we can. And one of the ways that we chose to do that, we, we, we do it on a chronic basis all the time to the level of hundreds of species, but we needed to kind of supercharge this thing. So what we decided to launch was this event called the LA Urban Ocean Expedition. We did this in August and September of last year, and I'll take you on a brief tour of, of what we did there. So if we start out here, um, this is coming out over the coast here. What we did was pull together a group of 20 something trained taxonomists from around the country by just putting out the word, like anyone interested? And everyone that we contacted said, oh yeah, I wanna be there. Because what we were going to do was go out into the field for a two week period seven days a week, 24 hours a day, have a bunch of people out in the ocean sampling and bringing back live specimens to a lab where the taxonomists could look at them, identify them live, which is so much easier than doing it when things are pickled. Um, you know, an animal <laughs> sitting in front of you is just, it's, it's so much better. Um, and they could take advantage of whatever we came up with uh, in their specialty, because taxonomists are usually very specialized. There's the crab guy, there's the ascidian woman, there's the, you know, whatever. People have these specialties. Um, this is like, it's like Christmas for these folks. You know, it's like they, this, this steady stream of amazing live specimens coming in. So everyone wanted to be there, everyone wanted to come. Um, we had to arrange all kinds of housing, feeding, all kinds of things like that. Um, but slowly, eventually, um, we end up with collecting boats um, sitting out off the coast and that will bring us to divers sitting on the back of that boat about to get into the water and start collecting specimens for this um, expedition. However, first we had to build a lab. So our lab at the museum is not nearly large enough to accommodate something like this. It's also 25 miles away from the ocean, which is a long way to truck live specimens. It's, it's crazy. So um, we started prospecting around here. And many of you are familiar with the Altice facility, um, which at this point is a very, very large, insanely large warehouse in the waterfront um, on, uh, right here in San Pedro um, that is currently undergoing renovations to become a, um, a marine science education and business incubator, but was available. And very generously, they allowed us to um, take up residence in their warehouse and build a lab. So we pretty much trucked down our entire lab from the Natural History Museum, um, set up tables, set up chairs, set up food, um, set up microscopes, uh, set up computers, set up uh, seawater tables to keep the animals alive, um, water chillers to keep seawater going, um, set up a whole functioning taxonomic lab that could accommodate these 20 taxonomists. Then for two weeks, we started collecting. So um, collecting was done in a huge variety of ways. This is, a, it's a very opportunistic kind of collecting. It's very different than something like going out to do an ecology study where you very quantitatively look at the number of organisms that are in a particular area. Our goal was to pick up the largest diversity that we possibly could. So we had divers out doing hand sampling. This, this um, footage was taken from an ROV from the Blue Robotics Company that uh, uh, tests their ROVs in the water around here. Um, and the mission of these divers was to go out and pick up um, the broadest diversity of invertebrate life that they could possibly find. So many different sites, different types of locations. Um, this particular location, these are on the, this is on the oil platforms off the shore. This is um, at about 100 feet, um, picking things off the oil platforms, which are covered in really interesting um, invertebrates. Um, we also sent out um, ships um, at the same time in parallel. 
we got incredible support from the um, sanitation treatment districts of the city and the county of LA. Those um, organizations run biological sampling all the time off the coast here. They're mandated to do so by state law. The um, environmental regulations that keep us safe mandate that they are out in the water doing research biology all the time. Um, this is one of, the, uh, one of their ships that uh, put down a, a, a bottom grab picking up soft sediment. So the soft sediment has come on board, is being um, washed out, picking the animals out, um, getting the animals clear of the sediment, and then coming back. So all of these specimens then had to be sorted and processed. So they came back to this, the facility at Alta C. This is dawn. Um, we started at about 7.30 every morning. Um, by 8 o'clock, everyone was hard at work. Um, samples would come in on, from dive boats or um, uh, from the uh, uh, dredging or netting um, operations that were coming in and then had to be sorted. So whatever came in um, was usually uh, laid out in trays and then either biologists or uh, uh, groups of volunteers that we had from a variety of sources came in to help us uh, do the initial rough sorting. It was also, um, we got tremendous help from students. This is a group of students from Cal State Dominguez Hills and they are, um, education, they are uh, teaching students uh, in STEM education. So they're learning how to teach science. And uh, they came in as a group um, and spent um, days and days um, working with us on this, um, helping sort things. And interestingly enough, their main project was working on the paleontological aspects. So because we hooked up with our invertebrate paleontologist, we as neontological biologists, people who work on live animals, um, when one of those bottom grabs comes, comes up, we, we want to get rid of the rocks and the shells, the dead shells and, and the mud. And, and Austin Hendy, our invertebrate paleontologist, was coming behind us going, no, 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 that mine, 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 mine. Um, give me that stuff. Um, and it was a real, you know, paradigm shifter for us. Like, oh, that's right. That's science too, isn't it? Um, so um, we, we coordinated with Austin and actually a number of the, of the uh, trips that we made out were coordinated to get the best samples for him to be able to compare what the, what the assemblage of shells is on the bottom, in the bottom um, uh, uh, off the uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula with the fossils that are in the cliff sides um, and to get insights into the ancient uh, communities based on the communities of today. So um, this group of uh, students was working primarily on that. Um, the rest of us, um, this is what was going on uh, more or less for two weeks. Some um, specimens came in, were sorted. Um, each specimen that came in uh, live was um, photographed live. Um, so we have um, a specimen ID number, live photograph of it. Um, specimens uh, then went to the taxonomists um, who were identifying them. They're, there's a table full of taxonomists happily identifying things. And you can see they're all working on microscopes Invertebrates are small. <laughs> People think of sea stars being this big. Yeah, those are out there. We got one. Um, but most things are small. Um, and uh, these guys are looking at micromollusks. You can, you can, that's huge, actually. Most of what they were looking, for, looking at were like sand grain size things, um, those gangs, those guys. So we pulled in a tremendous number of really extraordinary specimens over this two week period. And I just, I just want to take you through a little walk through some of these um, animals. I'm not going to try to ID them all for you or anything. I can't. I'm, I'm not a taxonomist. Um, but it is extraordinary to understand that these are animals that live off this coast today, um, go right off the shore, right on the beach, right on a rocky shore, and these are the animals that live in our home. And uh, to us, this is uh, an amazing reminder of the extraordinary richness and beauty that exists right beneath our toes. And that people like the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium are dedicated to putting you in touch with. We also wanted to get people in touch with what we were doing there, so we were able to have a day um, during this two-week period that we opened up to the public to come visit, um, to explore the expedition, and we had uh, a number of people, about 400 people, came and uh, visited, um, along with uh, other partners that uh, we often work with who wanted to come and share this with us, Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific, the Roundhouse Aquarium, a number of other organizations came and uh, spent a little time with some of the folks who came to visit um, with us. One of the reaction, not one of the, a, a reaction we got many times from the folks who came to visit, which um, meant a lot to us, was that they were deeply pleased to be coming to visit something that was not a science-like activity 
or a fun little intro to science kind of thing. This was science happening. And they got to come visit and see it happening while it was going on, while the uh, researchers were, were sitting there uh, working away on their organisms, which was, was really fun. So real brief, briefly, what did we get out of this thing? So two weeks of work. Um, these are the places we sampled. Um, we sampled 100 some odd localities um, in various um, modalities around the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, we got a lot of specimens. Um, this is a table full of uh, specimens. Um, so 14 days, 122 sites, um, 12 boat trips, 34 dives, um, 10 county research vessel trips, a bunch of grabs and trawls and traps, uh, one tall ship sail, thank you. Um, um, uh, uh, thank you, Lammy. Um, underwater ROV trips, the aerial drone footage, 400 visitors um, came to uh, uh, visit us on the ex expedition day. We had a huge number of staff from the Natural History Museum who came down and worked with us, whose job is not biology. Um, but they wanted to come experience um, this part of, of uh, what their uh, institution does. Um, about 864 hours of volunteer and student support, 27 taxonomists came and worked the two weeks. Um, so we got 4,300 specimen lots um, in two weeks of sampling, which is, was a tremendous, tremendous success. Um, of that, we believe at this point, this is based on preliminary visual identifications of these, about 1,173 unique taxa. Um, most of the species level, some of them, you know, we, we're not sure what the species is, but we know the genus or the family. Um, we're pretty sure there's at least 70 some undescribed species in that lot. And that's because there's, there's a lot of um, species that are out there that people have seen are not like the ones that are most closely related, but no one's had the time and put in the effort to describe them yet. So those are the ones we saw. So doubtless there are others that we're not even recognizing yet. Um, and this was done with the tremendous support of a huge number of organizations. We estimate about a quarter of a million dollars support um, donated to do this by uh, this extraordinary group of partners and contributors who helped us pull this whole thing off. And you can see the variety of organizations um, that worked with us. Um, so that happened in um, August and September of last year. But we would like also to invite you to join us, because we're not done. Um, we keep doing exploratory trips um, to the field because, as I said, this was a very ad hoc sampling kind of thing. Get everything you can. Um, we're now finding where the holes are. What do we need to, to find out more about that we don't have, um, that we were unable to collect? So there are a number of events coming up. Um, these are a few things that we're doing in the near future in March and April and around the 1st to 6th of June. I'll put this up again later, but just to let you know that um, we are doing some things. Um, one of the things I'd like to, to sort of wind up with here is um, a short video that was prepared for us by some visitors we had from the Hakai Institute in British Columbia. Again, as I said, people came from all over. Um, there was a group of professional science communicators who came down um, from that institute, which is a, a marine lab in um, British Columbia. And uh, in the first two days um, of the expedition, produced this. Once again, I'd like to invite you to come join us um, as possible. Um, we'd love to have you come experience some of this work um, with us. 
and share it with you. And uh, I hope that uh, between Regina and myself, we've given you a little peek into where we're coming from as a museum in terms of studying biodiversity and a little bit about where we're going. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you. And we're happy to take some questions. And yes, we'll take questions. Although I, I gotta move away from the microphone. I can't, I can't stand there. It's anymore. terrible to be tied up against the microphone. <laughs> Please. Um, did you look for any parasitic or commensal organisms? Yes. We, they were there. They were there. They were there. Yes. Some were, were picked up. Um, Ralph. I might, I might just turn that over to Ralph. But, exactly. Uh, but um, but uh, we did. Um, uh, we had uh, some work specifically working with Ralph Appy, who uh, works on parasites. Um, some of the people, the, some of the taxonomists uh, working with us um, are very aware of the parasites on their organisms. We didn't have, um, of the, the 27 that I m mentioned there, with the exception of you know, Ralph and Julie. And Don Kagan. Or in there and Don Kagan. Oh, okay, I'm wrong. There are people who specialize on parasites too um, who were there. So yeah, we were definitely looking for, for parasites. This is about biodiversity. So yeah, everybody's got somebody living on them. And so, yeah. Um, you were mentioning <clears throat> about the copepods that didn't have DNA. Yes. It's a They're sad small. Story. <laughs> there seems to be some sort of priming issues. And I tried doing a PhD dissertation on harpactocoids, again, when molecular biology was using 150 microliter volumes to do a PCR extraction and, and amplification. And I was unsuccessful, and hence I moved back to my favorite group of isopods. Um, what we're finding with some of the barcode data and with the environmental DNA data is they, as a group, seem to be missing when you know the environments have harpactocoids and calanoids, yet we can pick up some of the parasitic ones. So probably the priming regions are problematic and they differ just uh, enough such that the area that we're targeting to amplify is not being primed and hence it's not being selected or there's some other sort of inhibition. And we have a few taxa that we're now starting to recognize as trained biologists, you expect these CDs in the environment and the um, molecular techniques that we're using haven't been refined enough to capture that or uh, take into account that discrepancy. So. Yes? I was wondering, you were saying that one of the things you were looking for was mitochondria and chloroplasts. Is that because they have their own DNA or? They have their own DNA and cells have so many more mitochondria than nuclear copies. So you can guarantee get mitochondrial DNA much, much more easily because it's just so much more of it to start with. So you can have things that are degraded or not as well preserved and still have a pretty good chance of getting a mitochondrial piece. Uh, is the mitochondrial DNA specific to that species? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. 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 Yeah. And again, the, the organelles and plants that are used in those markers, again, have been honed in for most things work really well. But again, there's going to be those exceptions. Um, some things have different rates of evolution, and that needs to be taken into account. And um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of feedback going back with data being churned out and things just being blasted against databases and what needs to be interpreted from by computational biologists, my point earlier, to what biologists know is the real world and bringing those together. Yeah, just I'll just piggyback on that just briefly. So the, the choice of which gene to pick to do this barcode kind of thing, we're talking about things that are maybe 600 base pairs long out of the billions of base pairs that are in each organism. Um, the choice of those genes is driven by this Goldilocks search for things that evolutionarily vary enough that there is some variation between species but don't vary so much that it's just noise. Um, and so for animals, this CO1 mitochondrial gene works for many. It doesn't work well at all in plants. It just doesn't distinguish plants. The plant, that gene is not evolving as quickly in that region that we like in plants. So it's not a useful marker. So hence RBCL and um, Matt K are used in plants, a chloroplast uh, gene. Interestingly enough, for example, in CO1 in animals, we use it for fish, and it works really very well for most fish, except rockfish. Rockfish have evolved so recently, have speciated so recently, that there's really almost no variation in the CO1 
um, gene for them, so we use a different marker for the rockfish. Um, so yet, the simple story we would love to say is that it's one gene for all of life that we can look at, and eh, well, you know, but eh, a handful. So, yeah. Alan. Who's next? So four points. You had three hundred natural observations of species and seven thousand odd on your. Um, All your DNA. Much more. Is there any way of assessing how much of that eDNA is migrating in or bleeding from other points? There's yes. 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 And yes. Um, so, and yes. so the the obvious yes is that yes. If you know, if you have a reference barcode for a species that is a known or suspected invasive species, you can look for that. Yeah, and that's pretty straightforward. So. Um, yeah, uh, sar so the, the invasive sargassum, we, I'll pretend we have a barcode reference for that. We could look for that and see if it's there. I don't actually know if we have one, but <laughs> go with me here. Um, so yeah, if you have the reference, you can look for it. If you don't, though, um, it becomes a population genetics question. Because invasive species or non-native species have come with a very, very small founder population at some point relative to species that have been living there and evolving in an area for millions of years. So they're genetically much more constrained. There's much, more, much less variation, generally speaking, in a population that is an invasive population than populations of species that have been living there a long time. To answer that question, though, you need a whole lot of genetic material. Um, because you can't do it from one individual. It's a question of how much variation there is in that species at that location. So you need many, many individuals, dozens or hundreds of individuals, uh, to, to start looking at that um, population genetic level. But that can be a good indicator that you've got a species. If, it's, if there's very, very little uh, variability within a species, it may indicate that that's a species that arrived there from a founder population of, could be just one pregnant mom. Um, or a very small number that started it, and therefore, and there hasn't been evolutionary time for that species to develop much variability. There are other reasons you might not have variation too, so, but that at least opens up the possibility of, of detecting that. So also in that area, in, in Pillar Point is a great example. So there is a, uh, a marina just to the south of it. It has a large estuarine area, so uh, uh, almost a mud flat turning into a sandy flat, then a rocky outcropping. And then as you probably, some of you might have noticed, when you went around the point, there were actually very, very few sampling sites at all by iNaturalist observers because it's part of a marine protected area and it's heavily protected such that people really can't go back there you have all kinds of runoff coming in. So you pick up a sizable amount of terrestrial organisms, cow, pig, other things that are coming in that, you, that accumulates in that area. DNA has a degradation period. And again, we are now becoming more sensitive to figuring out how long it takes to um, degradate DNA. It depends on the clay. The, how sandy the soil is, the organisms, how much UV light, the temperature, and on and on. So all of those are uh, factors that go into making these really large um, DNA um, uh, uh, molecular summaries. genetic summaries of, of taxa. Yeah. Sure. Speaking of DNA, uh, you know, degrading, how long does it last when you put it in the alcohol? You know, you got your s stores of it can last forever. Um, so classically, DNA has been used so you can extract DNA from ancient urns, Egyptian, Roman urns, and people can generate DNA. If the organism's large, it has a lot of DNA to start with. If you choose to work on mitochondria, you've got even more genetic material to work on. And it preserves it in pretty long fragments. High enough alcohol concentration, um, we use 95% ethanol in the laboratory. If I don't have that available, you look for 200 proof rum, vodka, your other favorite drink. It smells beautiful when you do the dissections under the scope. It's really nice. Um, and it works fantastic. So you can, you know, DNA will last a very, very long time. Ancient DNA, the stuff's been frozen, ancient mammoth and all of those stories, you can generate that. What happened in the marine world is alcohol is flammable. It also destroys color of organisms. 
So marine folks in the 1920s and 30s discovered formaldehyde. 55 gallon drum, you put it on a ship, you dilute it to 10% with seawater. It's not flammable. Color is better preserved. We didn't know it was a carcinogen. It was in baby shampoo all the way through the 80s. It makes hair soft because it breaks proteins. It does all kinds of cross-linking things. Lots of these large expeditions that are part of the storehouses of our marine collections at the museum have gone through that process. The Alan Hancock collections are part of our institution. Folks are working on figuring out how to get DNA from those collections. If you're a Neanderthal, if you are a Denisovian, if you're an ancient mammoth, or uh, the, the Otzi man from um, Tyrol, you have money to generate those kinds of DNA fragments and rebuild them. You also have scaffolding um, of organisms where you have full genomes where you can take an extinct organism and match them back up. For the diversity of 34, 33, 34, 35 phyla of animals, we don't have that. And hence right now we are going back out using 95% ethanol to augment the existing collections in hopes that we can go back to our collections and look at the extinct shrimp from the LA River that's on our shelf. Mas. Virginia, um, I have two questions about uh, eDNA. One that is really more of a comment, I think, is um, you, you can't really get abundance information from eDNA, is that correct? Can you get like relative, I know you can't get absolute numbers, but you can get like perhaps relative abundance, like a lot of them are there, or a moderate amount, or just a few? Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. And those systems have been best worked out in uh, river systems, not necessarily open ocean. Again, fisheries are very keen on trying to figure out if they don't have to go out in the net in order to sample of what the bio standing stock is of a particular fisheries. Being able to do that with environmental DNA would be advantageous. And again, there's um, computational ways of trying to get at that and standardize it. And there's a lot of folks putting a lot of energy into trying to get that from the laboratory out into the, the world such that it becomes a useful management tool. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just jump on quickly on that one. So the thinking right now is that we can probably get, with some degree of, of reasonableness, relative abundances within a species, but not between species. Because the idea is that the amplification stage has so many biases between different species that you, you, that's a fool's game to try to compare different species. But within a species, those biases should be the same. So again, as Regina said, there's people working on trying to get that. Not here yet, though. Yeah. The, the second question, I'll, actually, I have another question now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we generated yeah. questions. <laughs> okay. um, the DNA polymerase, polymer OK, so that's how you're amplifying. Yes. Okay. My understanding is that the time it takes to get to a certain threshold where the machine can actually read it, you can backtrack because of the time element that how much of that particular DNA is actually there. Is that how you get the relative abundance? That can be done for specific, uh, to quantify DNA for a particular species. You can do that quite accurately, yes. But, but, that's, but that's actually different than what we do. And I'll, I'll, I'll get you in a second, which is that that's using a, a system called quantitative PCR, qPCR, that actually does that measurement with a single gene and a single, at a single time. When we run these what are called metabarcoding studies, where we're looking at all of the sequences in a jar of seawater, those are running through a high throughput sequencer. And there you're looking at the number of reads for each unique sequence. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a slightly different process, but the same basic idea that, yeah, I mean, the, the more copies you have, it is likely the more you started with. So, yeah. Um, the, okay, my last question, I swear. <laughs> um, eDNA analysis can't distinguish between <coughs> live and dead. Correct. Right? It, it's just DNA. It's and DNA. so um, I can see a slight downside on this. Um, where you would have like a, a predator that has eaten something and then okay. defecated and then you collect it in a water sample and you presume or we presume or whatever, the results indicate 
that this particular organism is found in this particular locality, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't. It was That's found correct. in the Arctic, you know, like a thousand miles away. Yeah. It, it may not be that far away. It, it looks like the even in, in ocean water, it's not that great a distance, and it does have a decay rate of hours, uh, possibly days in colder water. So it's not going to be that long. But yes, a dead whale is going to have a massive impact into a, yeah. a local area compared to something that's really rare. Yeah. So all of these um, tools, and again, we talked about making multiple copies, amplifying the DNA, are still constrained to, in order to be able to read the A's, G's, T's, and C's in the order they come off in, the mechanism is, is you have to make many copies of it, and then you slice it all back up, and then you read that across a laser as you've tagged the A's, G's, and T's in different colors, basically, and you rebuild the sequence. The day is coming where we don't have to do that amplification step, and then you would actually be reading the number of DNA fragments that went through into the whole thing, and you don't have the bias of this amplification. Because again, the polymerase and those reactions are it's like who's there first is going to get more copies. And that goes to your qPCR question, which does um, actually give you a count of how many reads you would have. Yes, please. Yeah. Is, is there a role for citizen science here? and uh, K through 12 students? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. So the Cal eDNA uh, folks, uh, again through the UC um, system in California paired up with us and the Cal uh, uh, Cali uh, folks, um, the soil samples were taken by citizen scientists and they've been taken across the entire state. We talked about the pillar point, the marine equivalent, because that's something that we're interested in doing here locally at um, uh, Point Furman. So there are multiple citizen science projects available now to participate in collecting eDNA and collecting um, iNaturalist records, which is something that, uh, again, opportunities up here that we will be going back out in order to have like a focal point. So this could be a testing ground. We get enough data points for iNaturalist. We get enough data points for soil samples, water samples from here. We should be getting better pictures of um, what's in the environment. But definitely, opportunities all the time coming up for eDNA and for citizen science to participate. So um, my question is involving the eDNA sequencing process. So I was just curious, because this is just a curious, uh, curiosity question. Oh, we don't want curiosity here. No, 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 I don't know about that. When you were doing the sequencing of the eDNA, did you happen to find any sequences of DNA from, say, a sea squirt? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We, we, got, we, we got those. Um, so when we, when we do this sequencing, we get millions of reads from a sample. Um, and this is where Regina's talking about, there's, this is where we turn to the bioinformatics folks, because it's more than you can have on a thumb drive. Um, and so there's a process of taking those reads and then trying to match them against, to find the best match in these data, I don't, I'm waving at my laptop like the database is there, um, to the database of sequences um, to find out what the thing is. Okay, sometimes, sure, hey, you get an identical match. Bingo, jackpot, you've identified the species for that unique sequence. More often you get a very close match and then you kind of squirm a little and say, yeah, okay, statistically that's almost certainly that, spe that species might have a couple of different base pairs different, but that's reasonable. I mean, that happens within species. Then you get ones that, you know, don't match too well, but it, you will find the closest match. So the one that sticks in our head uh, from the pillar point study, again, where you have bioinformatics people who come up and give us this list and like, we're done, here's your list and they had matched against the international database, and we look at the list, and because it was sorted alphabetically, one of the first things we saw was an organism called Acanthaster plankai, um, which if anyone has ever watched documentaries of- Who knows of, what Acanthaster is? Yeah, who knows Acanthaster? Oh, good. Crown okay. of thorns starfish. Yes. Um, it is a tropical starfish. That, that eats corals. Eats coral, reef building corals. There is zero chance there was an Acanthaster at Pillar Point. But most likely, that was the closest match to some poor starfish that was at Pillar Point, and it, that's the best match we got, so we got that name. Um, we also get a lot of sequences that the statistics in the matching just basically go, 
Not going there. No clue what this thing is. But you know what? It's closest to the Ascidians. It's probably an Ascidian. So sometimes we can get higher level resolution of these sequences. And then there's the, the, the chum bucket, you know? I mean, there's, there's the ones that come out and this don't really match up with anything and we don't really know what those are. And there's a huge amount of filtration, digital filtration that goes on to get rid of that stuff. So we end up with what are statistically reasonable matches, which then you start looking at as a biologist and going, maybe we need to turn that knob a little further, you know, whatever. And so so that's, it's, it's an iterative process, but that again is, super important to inform with as full a database of sequences as we can possibly get of vetted, correct reference sequences, because that's how we will ensure that we, if the thing is there, it has something to match to. So yeah, it's an it's a informatically intense process. So the point, again, it needs really skilled biologists, people that understand the environment to understand what is real bioinformatic people that can do the interpretation and the language to go between these groups that have not traditionally spoken to one another to make sense of the world if we're going to use this as a management tool and clearly this is what you know we're hoping to do because it's you know you don't have to go out and kill organisms to do this you're taking seawater you're taking soil samples so you know it's a, it's a benefit there so yeah really cool tool really exciting times maybe one more question um, so through the database, have people ever found may maybe like evidence of a new species, con like when a bunch of different genomes that don't really match up? Absolutely. Absolutely. So All the question the is, is uh, do we ever find something in the databases um, uh, that are new sequences or new specimens? So one of the things, I come from a, a systematics um, background. I like phylogenetic trees. I look at family relationships of uh, animals in a um, relational um, uh, background in a hierarchy. So I, I describe species, I identify species, and again, to make the process go faster, when I have hundreds and hundreds of jars, museum jars set up, and I don't have time to look at every one, sometimes it's just faster to sequence them all, build a tree, and then look for anomalies. We're working on a small project right now where the type species for some little isopod has been lost. We've re-described that. We've recollected new material from the type locality that it came from. And we sequenced everything else around it in that genus for, this is from Washington all the way down here to Southern California. And in San Francisco Bay, we realized we have a clade of something that's recognizable. I can't tell you what the name of it is and it matches something most closely related that came from Japan that was introduced with oyster farming in Tamales Bay. And again, there's no genetic variation. All the specimens are pretty much the same. They came from two localities, but I can tell you that it's quite distant related from other species that occur naturally on the Eastern Pacific shore. So yes, it makes it much faster, so now I can go back and visually look at the, those particular specimens. Yes, nope. one last one. Yes. Okay, then we'll do the rest of them so in, the, in, the, in the gift shop. Join okay. us in the gift shop. Yeah. Uh, please, please join me in uh, thanking Regina and Dean for the time. And we have all the staff and everything that you with this gift from the gift shop. So I'm going to interrupt for a moment because we've been here before. So we know, we know the drill here. We know how this works. So we have a little gift um, for Julie um, from our group. Uh, we have a disco embroidered beach towel for you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.